widespread in its use in astronomy. Um, but also neural networks are just kind of everywhere. They're everywhere in tech, they're everywhere in industry. Uh, they're only becoming more widespread. Uh, and so I think it's, it's kind of a fundamental aspect of, of scientific literacy almost to have a, a basic familiarity uh, with how they work. So hopefully I can convey a little bit of that uh, today. Uh, so I wanted to begin by just addressing what is a neural network. Um, and a neural network is a model fundamentally that maps some input data, let's call that X, to some output data, which we'll call Y, um, like many other techniques I'm sure you've studied uh, in this course. Um, but a neural network, there's a little bit of linguistic separateness here because the neural network is not only the model itself, but the neural network also encompasses a method for fitting the model. So um, it's a method for specifying this model and then starting from a bad initial guess, but improving um, gradually by looking at successively more examples of correctly matched input and output data. Uh, that's called the training data. So all of this will get more specific in, in, in the next few minutes. Uh, how is a neural network different from other types of modeling that you might be familiar with um, from earlier in this class? Uh, for example, how is it different from fitting a parametric model to your input data X? Uh, so let's say that the data you're trying to fit is the light curve of a transiting planet. Uh, you can write down a parametric model for what you might expect a transit to look like in that light curve. It might depend on a handful of parameters like the size of the planet relative to the star and the planet's period, et cetera. Um, a neural network is, is quite different from that situation. A neural network usually has many, many more parameters than we're used to working with. Um, small neural networks have the order of hundreds to thousands of parameters, but the state of the art really powerful neural networks that places like Google are, are working on all the time have billions of parameters um, as, of, as of now. <laughs> uh, and they're, they're growing <laughs> all the time. Um, a neural network is also a really powerful model because it's able to decide for itself which facets of the input data it thinks are important um, in specifying the output data. Uh, and it's able to ignore the facets that it decides are not important. Um, and along with that, it's able to take the input uh, the facets of the input data that it does decide are important, and it's able to sort of mix and match them to create um, representations, higher level representations, uh, that it decides map more closely to the output data than whatever it started with. So for example, if I give a neural network a stellar radius as one of its input parameters with a little bit of uh, sort of a few operations, the neural network might decide like, oh, actually stellar radius squared is more important to me than stellar radius. So it'll, it'll, it'll be able to build up that feature itself uh, and use it to, to, uh, to fit the uh, training set better. Um, and as a result of all these abilities, the mapping that the neural network creates between the input data and the output data is usually very complicated uh, and nonlinear. Uh, and that actually makes it quite difficult to interpret sometimes, um, as we will see uh, a little bit farther down the line. Uh, and I wanted to begin after just that brief introduction by discussing what are the types or the classes of problems that neural networks are appropriate for, kind of why were they invented, what problems were they designed to solve, um, and what problems are they maybe not appropriate to solve. So one of the canonical examples of a really good neural network problem is a classification problem that's easy for a person to do, um, but it's actually really hard to write down specific algorithmic rules for. So one of the classic examples is deciding whether an email is uh, a spam email or not. Um, I think most of us just like looking at most spam emails would be able to recognize, oh yes, this is a spam email or vice versa. Um, but it's not always easy to, to say exactly how we made that decision. And it's not easy to write down in, in terms of code if you were to instruct a computer to try to make the decision the same way you did. Um, that's actually a lot more difficult than it sounds. And if it's a problem like that, a neural network is a really good approach. So um, another example of a type of problem like that is mapping an image to a description of what's in the image. So. Here is an example. Uh, let's say we're interested in recognizing uh, digits in zip codes on handwritten envelopes. This is a problem that neural networks were able to solve um, all the way back to uh, as early as the 90s, even when computers were not yet that powerful, which is it's quite cool. Um, so let's say that our input data is an image of a number, a digit. Um, and just because when we're talking about building neural networks, we need to be quite specific about the numerical form our data is taking. Let's say that this image is 28 pixels squared and at each pixel we have a grayscale value. So at each pixel we have a value from one, which is a black pixel to zero, which would be a, a white pixel or a transparent pixel. So this data is a 28 by 28 array. 
Um, and we desire to map that data to an output, which is just a scalar, an integer. So the neural network, ideally, by looking at many, many examples of correctly labeled images, um, we'll be able to learn a mapping and be able to look at this handwritten digit and classify it as, oh yes, this is a two. Um, and the reason this is such a good neural network problem, again, is because all of us can do this quite easily, um, but it's hard to really under, like really write down, especially in a systematic way, how we're able to do this, right? Like I, we can look at some, some numbers have curly parts, others are, are more angular, but it's, I, I would be quite lost if I, if I had to try to instruct a computer directly how to do this. But neural networks can learn how to do it for themselves. It's very powerful. Um, this technique has improved by leaps and bounds even in the last five years. So when I was first learning uh, the basics of neural networks as a senior in undergrad, um, the Postal Service digit recognition example was still kind of the, the classic teaching example. Now neural networks are capable of things like this. <laughs> they can take uh, an arbitrary input image um, and they can label it by what's in it. A neural, neural network can quite capably now look at an image of a dog and tell you that what is in it is a dog, <laughs> which is a much more complicated problem than just identifying a digit. So the digit problem fundamentally is just a classification one. You know the digit is gonna be something from zero to nine. So there's sort of 10 choices and it's just a question of which is the best fit. Um, this is much more open-ended and there are thousands of concepts that could accurately describe what's in any given picture um, that you might choose to feed into a network. So um, in this case, what, we, what a network is capable of doing is it takes this input data. Again, it's a, it's a form of a, let's say it's 512 pixels squared and each pixel has uh, RGB values to specify the colors. A network would be capable of mapping this input data to data that represents this abstract concept of dog. Um, and this is another advancement, again, that is quite recent. Um, people have now invented these libraries of abstract concepts, linguistic concepts, uh, that sort of live in a very high dimensional space. So you specify a concept like dog by its coordinates in, let's say, a 100 dimensional space. And the idea is that related concepts sort of live nearby each other in, in this very high dimensional space. So just in terms of what the format of this data would be, the network would be attempting to learn a relationship between this array of 512 by 500, 512 by three, and let's say a vector of 100 entries, which represents a coordinate or an address of the labeled dog in this high dimensional space in which language concepts are embedded. Um, this also has uses in astronomy. It's not just uh, recognizing images uh, for image recognition's sake. Um, this was some work from back in 2018. Um, it turns out that neural networks are quite capable of classifying planet signals or potential planet signals um, by looking at a light curve, which again is an array of uh, pairs of time and the flux of that particular time, and deciding whether these signals are planets or false positives. So just a binary flag of planet or not planet. Um, so this is one category of problem that it's, it's very appropriate to use a network to do. A classification problem that a person can do, but maybe you have many, many uh, data that you would like to classify that you wouldn't like to do by hand. Um, another sort of canonical type of neural network problems are problems where we have a lot of data and we're more interested in accomplishing a task using those data than we are in uh, the sort of details of how that task is accomplished. It's a little bit abstract, so I'll give an example. Um, I once worked on a project as an undergrad where we had a lot of galaxies we had images of, so we knew the colors of these galaxies. It's quite uh, broad information about these galaxies, and we wanted to sort them into galaxies that were nearby, so foreground galaxies versus far away background galaxies. Um, and we wanted to do this with as little information as possible. We wanted to work with just the images we already had because we didn't want to take any expensive follow-up observations of all the galaxies in this sample. We wanted to prioritize the nearby ones. Uh, and telescope time is, pre is precious, so you don't want to waste it on, on uh, background targets that are not interesting to you. Um, so this is a task. It's a well-defined task. We're not interested in the why <laughs> because the theory of how we tell if a galaxy is nearby or far away is very well established. We weren't attempting to answer that question in this project. Uh, in order to do that, you just, you need a spectrum and you look at how redshifted it is. And based on your understanding, the universe is expanding over time. The ones that are more redshifted are farther away. Um, 
But again, since that's already been established, we didn't need our network to, to, to know that. We didn't need our network to care about that. We just needed it to be able to pick up on what in it, whatever information was available in these low resolution images to predict foreground versus background. So we trained a neural network just based on, we gave it for every picture of a galaxy, we just gave it a list of that galaxy's magnitude um, in, in the, the different bands of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And then we predicted, again, a binary flag, is this a foreground or a background galaxy? We could do that quite successfully, which was exciting. Um, and lastly, uh, a reason that you might use a neural network, um, and this is a category of problem where you might run into trouble, this can get a little bit dangerous, is if you have a lot of data and you know that the data contains information about the thing you wanna learn about, but perhaps you don't have an adequate uh, theory built up to be able to extract that data uh, in a way um, that's motivated by theory. Um, so you just wanna see, like if I, if I fit a really, precise and powerful model to this data, how much information is in there. Um, I say this is dangerous as someone who has just finished a project that I think would fall safely in this category. Um, you have to be very careful because neural networks are very powerful models and they will learn whatever's in your training set, regardless of whether it's scientifically important. <laughs> uh, so you have to be quite careful along the way to make sure that you're testing and make sure that your um, whatever output you're getting, whatever neural network model predictions you're getting are actually kind of fundamentally scientifically meaningful instead of artifacts of your particular training set, for example. Um, one way to do this that I think is really uh, kind of safe from, from veering into dangerous territory is to work with simulated data. Um, so this is a project that uh, one of my uh, cohort PhD students at Columbia was working on a couple years ago. Um, if you start from a weak lensing map, which is essentially a map of how galaxies are distorted by, uh, the images of galaxies rather are distorted by matter in the foreground, because so the light lenses around this matter in the foreground, can you infer what were the parameters of the cosmology <laughs> uh, that created that density distribution in the first place? Um, and that's a very complicated question. Cosmology is a very complicated subject, but what they did was they worked with simulated data. So they started from a simulated universe. They decided on some cosmological parameters. They let the universe evolve in their simulation. And then they sliced it up into maps of just slices of density. Um, and so this is an example of their input data. They have truly, it's an image and at each pixel you have a density value, how dense is the universe at that location. Uh, and then you work from these data and you try to infer the cosmological parameters that created it. And because all of this is simulated, you have a really good handle on whether you're introducing artifacts or whether you're recovering true information or spurious information. Um, and you don't have that same leverage if you're working with actual observations. So you just have to be a little bit careful. Uh, and the reason I highlight this example in particular is because uh, I wanted to make the point that neural networks are not just for classification. You can also use them for regression problems. You can also use them to predict numerical values uh, that you then can compare to actual observations. So the output in this case were two scalar numbers that then compared to the values they had input to the simulation in the first place. Um, so yeah, so these are a few categories of problems where you might use a neural network. Um, and now let's talk about how a neural network works. Uh, so let's just begin by uh, assembling a list of the ingredients for a neural network model. So the first thing you need is a way to represent your input data X and your output data Y numerically. So that could be, uh, if you have an image, again, you represent it as a grid of pixels with numerical values associated with it. If it's an email that you're trying to decide if it's spam or not, you could represent it as a, a list of a few different uh, types of metadata, like for example, the number of characters in the email or uh, a yes or no flag for whether the sender was in your contacts list. So you have to be a little bit creative sometimes with how you, how you summarize your data, but you need, it, you need it to be able to, to be communicable to a computer, so it all has to be numerical. Um, and let's just assume if we're building a neural network model, let's assume that we have this. Uh, the next thing we need is a set of training data. So these are correctly matched examples of pairs, X and Y. So these are inputs and outputs that correspond to one another. Um, and again, if we're talking about building a neural network, let's assume that we have this too. Uh, and the next thing we need is a mapping. So a sequence of operations that takes data that's in the same shape as your input, X, uh, and through some sequence of mathematical operations and transformations, outputs uh, data that's in the same shape as your output Y. Uh, and I understand this is a slightly bizarre way to phrase this. This is a sort of contentless uh, transformation. It's just sort of getting things from the right shape to the right shape. Um, so it's a sort of 
it's it's outputting data in the right form. You can compare that to the truth, um, but I'm not saying anything yet about what is in that transformation. Um, but then you need a way of evaluating the quality of that transformation. So if you you have this mapping, it's going from your input shape to your output shape. What happens if you take an example X from your training set and you run it through the network? You get an output that's in the right shape as Y, but it's probably not anything like the actual Y. You need a way to compare those two, what the network is outputting and what the actual truth, the true output is. And by sort of gradually taking steps to reduce the distance between those things, you can end up with a much better mapping than you started with. Um, so we'll go through all that in, in some more detail, but I wanna start with how you actually build up this mapping in the first place. Uh, so then now we're gonna be talking about neurons uh, and network structure. This is just a, a diagram, a schematic illustration of the type of thing that we're building up to uh, a finished neural network. So um, the neural network is the mapping. It is the mapping that maps X to Y. Um, and it may be very, very complicated, uh, and it probably will be very, very complicated given the types of applications that neuro neural networks are used for, but they're always made of simple and modular building blocks, and these are called neurons. Um, I should say all of this, this neuron structure and the building up of neurons into complicated networks, all of this is sort of vaguely inspired by how the, the brain was was thought to work um, back in the 1960s when people were first discussing this type of model. Uh, we now know that whatever is going on in actual brains, it's way more complicated than this. So the, the sort of the nomenclature of neurons and neural networks is uh, historical, but it's not representing anything truthful about how, how brains actually work. Um, so it's, in keep, it's important to keep that in mind, um, but it's still useful. So. Uh, if we were to try to investigate neuron, neural networks at the neuron level, like what is an individual neuron doing? Um, this is how you draw a picture of a neuron. So it's got one or more inputs. It's got a sort of a body of the neuron that takes those inputs and performs some sequence of operations that transmute them or transform them into an output. And then it's got a single output. So this is the fundamental unit of a neural network uh, is this neuron. And by stringing many of these neurons together, and not just in series, but also in parallel, so you have many, many, many neurons sort of feeding into each other in layers and, and propagating information forward, you can create this flow of information that goes all the way from your inputs at one end to the outputs. Um, and each one of these neurons individually is only doing a little operation, it's only doing a little transformation. But by building up many, many of these neurons that all talk to each other and feed information forward, um, you can create quite a complicated transformation between X and Y when you consider the network as a whole. Um, so let's talk about what each net, what, what each neuron individually is doing, because this is quite simple, um, considering the complexity of the ultimate model. Um, and you can break it down into some, some concrete steps. So let's draw the neuron picture again, but a little bit bigger. Um, and let's say that this neuron is taking three inputs, uh, let's call them Q1 through Q3. And these are just numbers, these are just scalars. If we're starting from the very beginning of the network, these might even be three, three numbers that we're feeding in that are, that are part of our, our input data X. Um, each one of these inputs passes to the body of the neuron, but it's mediated by another parameter called a weight. So each one of these connections that connects the input to the neuron itself has a weight associated with it. And the first thing that the neuron does is it calculates the weighted sum of all these inputs. So it calculates the quantity Q1, W1 plus Q2, W2 plus Q3, W3. So you've got all the inputs, but they're all differently weighted according to the values of these Ws. The next thing the neuron does is that it adds in this extra parameter B, which is called a bias. Um, and this is just an extra little degree of freedom so that the neuron can kind of uh, consider the entire output of the weighted sum uh, in addition to each of the terms individually. And then finally, it takes that whole thing, the weighted sum plus this by its term B, and it runs it through another function, an activation function, uh, which we'll call F. So this is all quite abstract. Uh, I'm gonna run through it just one more time because I know it's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, this is what the output of the neuron looks like. So once again, uh, the neuron, in order to, in order to create this output, it takes this weighted sum, 
Uh, so the W's times the Q's, I'll add it together. It adds in this bias term, B, and then all of that gets passed to this function F, which is called the activation function. Um, there's a slightly more succinct way to write this, which is this F, you do the activation function on the dot product of the W vector and the Q vector plus B, but that's, there's, there's, there's a million different ways to express uh, neural network math, so it's, it's not super important to, to pay attention to that. But. Um, so let's talk about each of these components in term. What are these weights and these biases? What is this activation function? Why are all these components here and why are they necessary? Um, so the weights and the bias, each connection in the neural network, which is each arrow in the diagram, has a weight associated with it. Uh, and each neuron, each circle in the diagram has a bias associated with it. Uh, and these are the parameters that your neural network is trying to optimize. So these are the parameters that are ultimately going to set the goodness of fit um, between what the neural network outputs and the truth from your training set. And so when the, as the neural network sees ever more training examples as it trains, the Ws and the Bs, the weights and the biases, are the things that get, get adjusted little by little to sort of gradually improve the mapping between the input and the output. And this will be clear in a, in a moment when we talk about training. Um, the activation function is really interesting because it is what introduces nonlinearity uh, into the mapping. So let's imagine for a moment that we didn't have an activation function. And instead, we just had a lot of neurons that were all connected to each other, but each one of them could only do this thing where it took the weighted sum of the inputs and added the bias. So it kind of doesn't matter how interconnected all your neurons got or how many, how many neurons in succession had access to that data. If that's all you're doing to the data, you're sort of multiplying it by W and adding B and then sort of just doing different linear combinations of all of that, you kind of can't create very interesting transformations of what you started from. So you can sort of slice and dice whatever you input, um, but you're not transforming it in any fundamental way. And so you're really hindering your network's ability um, to come up with more interesting features. Like for example, the example I gave uh, back when I said that the neural, the, the network can, uh, if you give it, for example, some parameter, it can decide for itself that that parameter squared might be a more interesting thing to work with. It wouldn't be able to do that if you didn't have this nonlinearity introduced in the, in the activation. So to make this a little bit more concrete, um, Let's just step through a couple different choices that you might make for your activation function and just explore what they allow you to do with your network. So uh, just for the purposes of this slide, let's let X stand in for everything that goes into the activation function. Um, so one choice that you might make for your activation function is this binary step or a heavy side function. So what this function does is it takes some input. If the input is less than zero, then the function outputs zero. And if the input is greater than zero, uh, then the function outputs one. So the function looks like this, or whichever way, backwards. Um, why might you choose this as your activation function? Well, this function basically transforms your neuron into a logic gate of sorts. So your neuron sees some input. It sees the weighted sum of the inputs plus b. And it's deciding, like, OK, if that sum is greater than some threshold value, I'm going to return 1. My neuron is going to fire. If that, that sum is less than some threshold value, then I'm going to return 0. My neuron is not going to fire. And so just by choosing this particular activation function, you've now enabled your network to do logical calculations um, on this particular combination of inputs. And so as we all know from working with computers, a logic gate is a very powerful tool. And if you build up many, many logic gates, you can do essentially anything, <laughs> you can do kind of infinite computation. So um, giving your network the capability to do this uh, is really important. So essentially, you're allowing your network to answer yes or no questions about uh, the data. Uh, this particular activation has one disadvantage, and that's that it's discontinuous um, at x equals 0. Uh, that makes it kind of numerically difficult to work with because we need to think about its derivative uh, in a moment. And given that it's discontinuous, the derivative is not defined at that, at that discontinuity. So sometimes people work with uh, a function that behaves similarly if you look far away from the x-axis, uh, but is smooth. So this is called the sigmoid function or the logistic function. Um, this is its functional form. And you can see that if you sub in like a very large x, x approaches infinity, then this function is 1. 
And if you sub in negative infinity, this function approaches zero. So at its tails, it looks a lot like the binary step. So it still enables you to ask these yes or no questions about your data. It can still behave like a logic gate. Um, but it has this additional advantage that it's smooth, so it's differentiable, which is it's numerically convenient for us. Um, another activation function you might choose uh, is if you needed your neuron to output uh, real valued um, numbers instead of just a one or a zero, instead of a binary choice, um, you might give it a linear activation function. So this is a function that's capable of returning uh, any positive or any negative number. And you might need this if your outputs um, are real value. So if you want your neural network to output a real number, you're going to be comparing to the real number from your training set. This might be a useful tool for the, just that output layer. Um, and finally, people are now, uh, again, when I was kind of first learning this stuff back in 2014, the sigmoid function was kind of the standard, and everyone was talking about sigmoids. People are now using much more sophisticated shapes that sort of uh, combine desirable qualities uh, from all of these above functions. So this is one called the sigmoid linear unit. Um, and it has this nice uh, binarity sort of to it. It's got either zero or it's a, a real valued number. Um, and it's got this smoothness, and it's got this, this nice uh, it can return any positive number too. So um, there are different activation functions that might be desirable for different situations. I think something like the sigmoid linear unit is a nice default choice because it kind of incorporates the nice properties of, of the others. Okay, so putting it all together, I know this is a ton of information. <laughs> um, an entire neural network consists of many, many neurons. Each of them has its own weights and its own bias. And these are organized into layers that talk to each other. Um, and traditionally, what's done is you organize your, your neurons into these layers. And then for every layer, you specify an activation function that every neuron in that layer will have. Um, I think this is just for, for reasons of computational uh, convenience, basically, and the sort of readability of these network diagrams, which, as we'll see in a moment, can get a little bit complicated. Um, so just as a simple example, let's design a network that takes in two inputs. Let's say it takes in the stellar radius and the temperature. And we want it to predict the stellar luminosity. So if we were just going to design a very basic network that might be able to do this, uh, we'd start from our input data. So this consists of these two numbers, stellar radius and stellar temperature. We're going to have these inputs feed forward into our first layer of neurons. Um, this is called the first hidden layer. So a hidden layer is just any layer that isn't the input or the output layer. I don't particularly know why it's called hidden. There's nothing especially mysterious about it. But um, So if we look at what this network is doing so far, we have these four neurons in our hidden layer. Each one of them receives as input both the radius and the temperature. And each one of these arrows has an associated weight that belongs to it. So, so far, we have eight weights, because uh, it's two times four. And then each of these circles, each of the neurons has a bias term as well. So that introduces four additional parameters, the bias, uh, the four bias terms for this hidden layer. Um, let's say we're interested in another hidden layer. Sort of the more layers you build up, the more, the more fancy your model can get, uh, essentially. So let's add another hidden layer. Let's give it three neurons. All of these choices are a little bit arbitrary. <laughs> without kind of experimenting with this actual setup and, and fine tuning the architecture. Um, we're making somewhat arbitrary choices. But so now we have the second in layer. Uh, it's got four times three equals 12 weights associated with it. And it's got an additional three bias terms. And let's say that now we've decided our model is complicated enough and we just want to output the luminosity, um, or ideally the luminosity uh, of the star. So now we've got a single neuron in our output layer. It's got three inputs from the three uh, neurons of the second in layer. And it's got one output, which is the stellar luminosity. So altogether, uh, we have eight weights feeding into the first hidden layer, plus four biases for the first hidden layer, plus 12 weights in between the two hidden layers, plus three biases for the second hidden layer, plus three weights feeding into the output, plus one additional bias. And I think that's 31 free parameters for this network. Um, and additionally, we have. Uh, three choices of activation function. Um, we need to choose a particular activation function that's going to happen at the first hidden layer. Uh, we need to choose an activation function for the second hidden layer. And we need to choose an activation function for the third, or for the output layer, rather. 
Um, and so all of this, in addition to uh, choosing the architecture in the first place, you can begin to see, like, first of all, how these models can get so big and so complicated, um, which correspondingly, how they can be so flexible and how they can do such a good, good job fitting very complicated data. Um, but you can also begin to see some hints of, of how this can spiral a little bit and you end up making a lot of choices that can sometimes feel a bit arbitrary. So that is some, something to keep an eye on if you're ever working with neural networks uh, in your own research. Um, just to highlight uh, one neuron at a time, uh, just because I know this, this whole diagram is a bit much, um, but if we look at just a single neuron, we can see the exact same input-output structure that we explored before. So what this individual neuron is doing, once again, it's taking the weighted sum of the inputs, which are the radius and the temperature, mediated by the two weights that are highlighted on the, those yellow arrows. Uh, it's taking that weighted sum, it's adding its bias term, it's spitting out through the activation function, uh, and then it's got a single output, um, neural networks are never, neural network diagrams are never ever drawn this way, which is a little bit annoying. Um, it should be kind of one output that spits into, splits into three arrows feeding into the, the three neurons of the next layer, but it's never drawn like this. <laughs> it's always just drawn as three arrows. You kind of get that because each, each arrow has a weight associated with it in these diagrams. So that's, that is why it's done, but it is, just feels a little bit less accurate um, than if they drew them this way. So uh, just to clear up that confusion. Okay, so that is how you build a neural network out of these fundamental units, which are neurons. Um, the next question is, how do you make this structure work for you? How do you actually set the weights and the biases such that the mapping between the input and the output data is faithful to what's going on in the training set? Because, I mean, if you gave me a set of, just to go back to our example, stellar radii and temperatures and luminosities, and you gave me that network structure and you said, okay, I need you to choose a combination of 31 free parameters that represents the relationship between radius and temperature and luminosity uh, faithfully. I simply could not do it. <laughs> that would be an impossible ask. Um, but luckily neural networks can start from a very bad guess um, at those free parameters. And then gradually by looking at more and more training examples, they can refine them. Um, and so that is what we will explore in this training section. So uh, to return briefly to our list of necessary ingredients for a neural network model, we've now discussed uh, what makes, how to, how to build up this mapping between the input and the output. Um, and now we need to talk about how to evaluate the goodness of that mapping and how to improve the mapping by looking at the data in the training set. So um, let's imagine that we are initializing our network. So we have our training set, which are these true pairs X and Y. Uh, we've chosen our architecture, we've chosen what activation functions we'll use, um, and we now have a, a structure that if you feed in something of the shape X, it will output something of the shape Y. In order to actually do that in practice, in order to give this network a set of numbers and actually do the computational steps to chug through it, get a, a numerical output, you need to choose values for these weights and these biases. So each, each connection in the network has a weight, each neuron has a bias, and we need to just choose numbers um, to plug into those, those, uh, those places in order to actually let the computation of the neural network proceed. So what is almost always done, I, I, I can't think of an example where this isn't done, um, is to initialize all these weights and bias terms as just small random numbers, uh, and then to improve them gradually with, with your training. So you start with just a random guess, and it's gonna be bad. <laughs> um, but, the fact that you have choice, you've chosen these numbers at all means that you can now insert your data X into your network and you will get some output in the shape of Y. Um, and let's call this, this output Y sub net. Uh, so this is the output that you get from your network having fed in your true X. Uh, and now to see how well the network is doing at this particular configuration of weights and biases, what you need to do is compare your network output Y said net to the true Y. So if they're close to each other, that means the mapping is good. Your network is doing a good job. This is a good choice for all the weights and the biases. Uh, but if they're far from each other, if they're, not, if they're not anything alike, that means that the mapping is bad, the network is doing a bad job, and the weights and the biases need to be adjusted to improve the mapping. So the way that this is done, um, First of all, to evaluate the distance between y sub net and y, uh, you define this thing, this, this object called the cost function, or c, which measures the distance between y sub net and y. Uh, 
Um, and the most common choice for cost function, uh, vastly most common, there are, sometimes you will encounter a different cost function, but really unless there's a particular, particularly unusual situation, um, almost all neural, neural networks that I've come across have used this cost function, um, is the mean squared error, um, or in machine learning parlance, the quadratic cost function. Um, and this is very simple. I think you've probably encountered it in astrostatistics already. It's sort of, it's a chi-squared essentially, um, but you're not accounting for any kind of uh, uncertainty. So it's the average over all of the samples in the training set uh, of the distance, the vector distance between your uh, y sub i, which is the true y associated with training example i, uh, and y sub net i, which is what you get if you feed x sub i through your network. And because uh, C, the cost function, is always positive, we're seeking to get as close to zero as possible. We want the y sub nets to be as close to the y sub i's as they possibly can be, uh, and we're trying to minimize this quantity C. Um, the reason that this is such a common cost function, the reason that almost everybody uses it, um, is because it's, first of all, it's very simple. Um, second, it's familiar from, from other contexts. So anyone who's studied statistics, anyone who's coming from physics, Anyone who's coming from computer science will be familiar with, uh, with this function. Um, and it also has this really nice property of being convex, um, which is easiest to show in a picture. Uh, if we plot C against Y sub net, uh, we see it's shaped like a bowl, which means uh, given our goal is sort of rolling downhill towards the minimum of C, um, we're not gonna be interrupted by anything unexpected, basically in the behavior of this function. Uh, we know that it's got this global optimum that we're trying to approach. Um, yeah, so this is, this is, this is basically, this is the cost function to use. Uh, so yeah, so how does training work given that we've specified our cost function and we now have our functioning network that is starting from a very bad guess at the weights and the biases. How do we use this cost function to improve our guesses for the weights and biases? So I guess a, a different way to state that question is we have this arrangement of weights and biases. What we want to do is just nudge those weights and biases a little bit and get a little bit better costs out at the, at the end. We wanna shrink C by just a little bit. The way to do this is to recognize that the cost function is a function of this object Y sub net, which is the output of the neural network. The output of the neural network is a function of all the weights and the biases. So given that we have this sort of this chain, we can use the chain rule um, to calculate the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to each weight and each bias. So, we can calculate the derivative of the cost function with respect to y sub net, multiply it by the derivative of y sub net with respect to each of the weights or each of the biases. Um, because this is computational, all of this is done by the computer. We're not doing any of this analytically, which is nice. Um, and the algorithm that computes these partial derivatives is called backpropagation. This is just an important piece of vocabulary to know. Uh, and the reason that it's called backpropagation is because it takes this desired change in C. We want to shrink C by just a little bit. Um, and it takes that, that change and it propagates it backwards through the network via the chain rule. So it starts at the end, which is where the, compu uh, the cost function is computed. And then it works backward layer by layer to sort of propagate that change all the way back to the weights and the biases, all the way at the beginning of the network. Um, yeah, so now we have all of the, the ingredients we need. Um, the way to understand exactly how this works in practice, I think is, uh, to visualize this, I think, let's imagine we have a very, very simple network. Um, let's imagine the simplest possible network, in fact, one that only has one weight and one neuron. <laughs> so it's basically going from input through one neuron to the output. So there's one weight and there's one bias. If we picture what the cost looks like as a function of the value of that weight term and the value of that bias term, we can see that the cost has some global minimum somewhere. That's where we wanna to get to. We wanna to get to the combination of weight and bias where the cost is lowest. Um, but if we randomly initialize the weight and the bias, we're not gonna be there. We're gonna be somewhere else. Uh, so let's say we initialize at this point on our landscape. Now, what we can use backpropagation to do is to calculate the partial derivatives uh, of C with respect to W and to B. Um, and if we have those partial derivatives, what we now know is the gradient of C. So we actually know the direction that points as downhill as we can possibly get. So that's, that's the definition of the gradient, is kind of the maximal downhill slope. 
Um, and so if we take a little step in the direction of that gradient and we update our weight and our bias, we now have a better uh, cost, we have improved the performance of the network, and we have a new set of weight and bias, um, which are a better arrangement than we started from. And we can just repeat this procedure over and over and over again, um, like looking at, at new and, and more training examples. Um, and kind of the more we do that, we just do that until we stop seeing improvements in C. That means we've gotten to the bottom of the bowl, uh, and then our network is trained. So that's, that's how it works. We just follow the gradient all the way downhill. Um, this is a little bit harder to picture in many, many dimensions. Um, of course, most networks do not have only one weight and one bias. They have up to billions of weights and biases. Um, that is impossible to picture. Um, but the sort of the basic premise of we have some landscape of cost that depends on the particular configuration of weights and biases, and we want to follow the, the slope of that cost landscape down to its minimum, uh, that still holds. So that's essentially what we're doing in training. Um, yep, I will skip this, this slide completely. Um, so this process by which we follow the gradient downhill, it's called gradient descent. Um, and I just wanted to briefly introduce a little bit more machine learning vocabulary because I find the machine learning literature so obscure. <laughs> like everything that has a name in machine learning has a different name in physics. So, uh, uh, for example, the cost function being called, uh, instead of the mean squared error, it's called the quadratic cost function. Like uh, you need a, a dictionary essentially to make sense of some of these things. So um, in practice, uh, when you're doing this training procedure, um, you have to choose an additional parameter, which is called the learning rate. And that's just the size of the step you take in the downhill direction at every training step. Um, you'll be very familiar with an analogous thing, which is the step size from MCMC. So if you set your learning rate or your step size too small, um, then you're, you approach your global minimum, but you do it very slowly. So uh, you might have some trade-offs in terms of speed. Uh, if you choose a learning rate that's too big, um, then you approach your global minimum a lot faster, but you might overshoot it and end up sort of stepping around it in a, in a clumsy way. Um, so that's another thing to keep track of. Um, often, a, a training strategy people will use as a slight modification of what I've described is to, instead of computing the cost over the entire training set uh, at each step, they will divide the training set into subsets. Um, and each subset is called a batch or even a mini batch. I don't know what the distinction is between a batch and a mini batch. I think those things are used more or less interchangeably. Um, but the point is that each train at each training step, you only look at one batch. So it's actually, it's a lot faster to compute the cost function over a little batch of training samples than over the entire training set. Um, and so at each step, you look at a different batch and things go a lot faster. There's a little bit of an accuracy trade-off, but it, it's a trade-off that everybody makes because the, the gain in speed is so extreme. Um, and because you're only looking at a, a random subset of the training step at each step, this is now called stochastic gradient descent instead of gradient descent. Um, one last piece of vocabulary, sometimes, um, training will stop prematurely. So there's two reasons that training might stop and they're both related to the gradient being zero. So either you get to the true minimum of your cost function, in which case the gradient is zero because you're at a flat bottom of the bowl, then there's no more training to do. Um, or somewhere in your network, um, one of your partial derivatives gets close to zero, uh, just numerically too close. Because remember your computer is representing all these numbers with some finite accuracy, right? So if your gradient happens to get too small, that it's confused to zero, um, that's called a vanishing gradient. And it means your training will stop because you can't take a step downhill if your downhill step is zero. Um, and so information will stop propagating through your network and, and you, won't, you won't keep training. So this is another reason that people prefer um, uh, activation functions that have a sort of slope to them to activation functions that are mostly flat. Um, because as you can see, an activation function that has a little bit of a slope, uh, it has a positive gradient. So your gradient is less likely to vanish in that situation than if you have a mostly flat activation function. Um, all of this is jargon. It's a little bit in the weeds. Um, but if you work with neural networks, you will encounter some of these things, and they are quite difficult to parse. It's coming from a physics background, so I thought I would include them. Um, Okay, so that was a, an absolutely whirlwind tour of how you build and train a neural network. Um, I acknowledge that 
it was very information dense. So please feel free to ask pepper me with questions at the end of it. Um, and this is not something that can be internalized. I think in one lecture, it's, it's quite, quite dense as a topic, but um, I think it's important to have seen it, uh, especially if you plan to work with these models in the future. And I wanted just for the second half um, to introduce some additional considerations uh, that you might think about um, if you're interested in working with neural, neural network models yourself, if you're interested in interpreting them when you see them in the literature, uh, or even just as I said, as a, as a part of sort of scientific literacy um, in today's world. So I've organized these considerations very loosely into three spheres. So practical considerations, scientific considerations, and ethical considerations. Um, this is not exhaustive. Um, these are just sort of things that occurred to me as I, as I spent the past few days refining this talk. So um, I'm gonna step through them, um, but yeah, just these are things to keep in mind, a non-exhaustive list of things to keep in mind if you work with neural networks. So uh, I'll begin with the purely practical and I've alluded to this already. Uh, machine learning and even the subdiscipline of, of neural network studies is its own discipline. It has its own literature, its own vocabulary, uh, its own nomenclature for even familiar uh, mathematical concepts. Um, very different from physics or astro or computer science or math. <laughs> so it can be quite difficult to sort of get your bearings in the machine learning literature. Um, and this is a problem that's sort of gradually improving as more and more astronomers are, are learning about uh, neural networks and sort of teaching each other. But uh, if you start to work with neural networks, don't be frustrated by this, I think is, is what I'm trying to say, because you will encounter a lot of this vocabulary confusion. It took me so long to work out that backpropagation was just the chain rule. <laughs> I don't know why that couldn't have been more clearly expressed in whatever class I was taking at the time, but um, these hurdles are kind of all over the place. So that's just the first consideration. Uh, the next I have also discussed a little bit already, um, because neural networks are so modular and there are so many choices associated with setting up a particular architecture, a particular choice of uh, activation functions, a particular choice of even the, the structure of the input data you, you decide to give, um, particular choice of hyperparameters like the learning rate. Um, it can result uh, in somewhat arbitrary choices. Um, and this is something, I, as, I, as I've said, I've just finished up a neural network uh, project myself and the referee on our paper uh, was very interested to know in, in how we were justifying, for example, our choice of network ar architecture and our choice of hyperparameters. Uh, and luckily I've been sort of keeping a record of, of why I did those things as I was doing those things, but uh, it's very important to do that. It's very important to sort of make sure that you can justify at each step what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, because as scientists, we, we prefer not to make arbitrary choices in our modeling. We'd like to do things that are motivated, but in this landscape of, of very complex models that are very powerful to fit to data, sometimes it's, it's difficult to justify one thing or another. Um, and this relates to my next consideration, which is that the standard of proof that's acceptable uh, in the machine learning community is quite different from what's acceptable in the scientific community or specifically astronomical community. So, Whereas if you're working purely with machine learning people, the sort of the success of the model might be its own justification. Like, oh yes, we have a model that successfully fits all our training examples to a very high accuracy. So therefore the model is good. Um, that's unlikely to fly in astronomy just because we're not only interested in the goodness of the model, we're also interested in, in, in its motivations. Why did you make the choices that you did in building up this model? Um, this was a sentiment I saw expressed really beautifully in a Twitter thread recently uh, by Kareem Carr, who is a scientist who sort of studies how scientists from different disciplines work with each other. Um, and particularly, he was talking about interdisciplinary work between statisticians, computer scientists, and machine learning specialists, who are all different communities with their own different standards of what counts as evidence, what counts as proof. Um, so the statisticians he was researching they were concerned with questions like, okay, we have a model, um, does it relate in some fundamental way to the theory of the thing that we're studying? Um, is it scientifically plausible? Uh, does it work really well on toy problems or simulated problems where we understand the data really well? Um, and meanwhile, the machine learning people were more concerned with, for example, is this successful um, for the particular application that we're using it for? Like, is it a good, is it good at fitting the data? Can we sell it? Does it make money? I mean, this sounds a little bit derogatory towards machine learning maybe. I don't think, I don't intend it that way. It's just 
the two fields have very different standards for what is a successful model. And communication between them can be quite tricky sometimes. So uh, what, what, what flies in machine learning might not fly in science um, and vice versa. And that's important to keep in mind, especially if you're getting your inspiration for machine learning projects from the machine learning community. Um, the next point, and this is a really important one, is that if you're using a neural network model, um, it has all of these parameters. It's got all of these weights and these biases. Um, even in just our toy model example, there were like 31 free parameters. Uh, and it's not obvious, just based on what I've said so far, how to quantify the uncertainty on these model parameters. So as scientists, we're not only interested in the best possible prediction of our model, we're also interested in getting a sense of the uncertainty envelope around that prediction, right? So it's not actually a complete scientific result to just present one outcome. <laughs> like we kind of need a sense of the distribution of possible outcomes given, given our model. Um, and as astrostats people, you are definitely aware of that. So, <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to bring up a paper. I mean, like this was something that I struggled with even up through and including this, this most recent project. Um, how do you establish an uncertainty on the prediction of a neural network? And I came across this paper um, in January. Uh, I think it came out at the very tail end of 2020. I think it's excellent. I just wanted to highlight it because I think it's, it's one of the most useful machine learning papers that I've read. Uh, it's by two particle physicists at Fermilab. Uh, and what they did is they wanted to compare a few different ways that people have invented of coming up with uncertainties on neural network predictions. And the way that they did that is that they started from a really simple physical system. It's one that uh, is sort of a staple of undergrad physics labs. You have a single pendulum. It's got a length L and a mass N at the, M at the end of it. It swings back and forth and you measure its period T. And the goal is to use these data to calculate the gravitational acceleration G um, at Earth's surface. So the, the correct answer, which I think mostly you're given in, in physics labs and you just try to, you, you have to sort of try to get the right number out of your measurements, but this is the relationship that you're trying to establish. So uh, what these two particle physicists did is take this system, um, come up with a bunch of simulated measurements as if they had done a bunch of measurements in the physics lab, train a neural network model to take in these measurements and try to output a prediction of G. Um, and so the network had to learn, for example, that uh, the length of the pendulum and the period were important, but the mass and the angular displacement were not. So the, the network had to sort of decide these things for itself. Um, and then they took, they took this neural network, they did these three different ways of establishing the uncertainty on it, and then they compared that to what you get if you just take the data that you started from and do the analytic error propagation, like you would, like you would do in a standard sort of, uh, sort of lab environment. And by comparing the, the, the analytic uh, estimate to what they got from these three different other ways of estimating a neural network error, they were able to actually say like, okay, one of these is definitively better than the other two, which is very good. Um, so what we're looking at here, these are plots of the analytic uncertainty on the x-axis versus the uncertainty that you get on, uh, from the neural network on the y-axis for the three different methods in the three colors. So ideally, if, if all three methods were really good, you would get all of them falling along this diagonal line. That's not what you see, <laughs> of course. So if you train your neural network with not enough representative uncertainty in the input data, um, then actually all three methods fail. So this is the first lesson is that in your training set, you need to have represented um, the actual observational uncertainty uh, of the thing that you're trying to model. So if you don't include enough uncertainty in the training set, the neural network is not gonna be able to give you a, me a meaningful uncertainty out the other end. That makes intuitive sense. Um, if you do have an appropriate amount of uncertainty, um, then one of the three consistently outperforms the other two. So uh, I will briefly describe what that one is. Uh, and if people are interested in the questions, uh, in the other two, uh, then we can talk about that in the in question period perhaps. But the, the best performing, um, the, the best way to do this, the best way to put an uncertainty on a neural network prediction turns out to be, you take your network, you've designed it, you've got your architecture, your hyperparameters, all that. Um, and then you randomly initialize your weights and biases, and then you train your network um, until the cost function ceases to improve. Um, and then you run your data through the network and you get predicted output, right? So 
uh, if you repeat that procedure many times from different random initializations of the weights and biases, what you end up with is a bunch of different, different networks that are very similar. They converge to a very similar place, um, but they don't have identical values for the weights and biases in the end. So by considering all of those networks that started from different random seeds as an ensemble, um, you, can, you can then take all of their predictions and treat those as an ensemble as well. So if you look at the, the, the sort of distribution of predictions that these differently seeded random networks give you, then that can constitute your error bar on the output. And they found that this, this method, um, it beat the other two uh, for a number of reasons. So if, and that's actually, it's really convenient because it's actually conceptually a lot simpler than the other two as well, which is really nice. So if you're in a situation where you're using a neural network to make a prediction, I recommend this approach. They call it the deep ensembles approach where you take your network, you just train it many times over from different random seeds and you look at the ensemble of predictions that result. Okay, uh, the next consideration uh, that it's important to keep in mind is that neural networks, especially the really powerful ones are very data hungry. Um, if you're gonna train a neural network that has billions of parameters in it, you need a huge training set, <laughs> consists of probably billions of training examples uh, in order to, to get anything meaningful. Um, that's a practical consideration because it's really hard to get it to assemble a data set of that size. I guess as astronomers, it's, it's less difficult than it might be in other subfields. So you can, you can run neural networks on you know, all of the billions of galaxies in SDSS, for example. Um, but in other domains, it might not be so easy. Uh, and this is something I ran into in my previous project as well. We were trying to run a neural network on the distribution of exoplanets. We only know of a few thousand exoplanets in, in neural network terms. That's, that's a very small number indeed. So um, the reason that this is an ethical consideration is, is for a couple of reasons. Um, Number one, a lot of these huge training sets, particularly the ones that are used for language modeling, so things like things that power Google Translate or, or image recognition on the internet, or even predictive texts like autocomplete, the training sets that uh, are used to train these huge models are scraped from the internet, generally speaking. It's the only repository of digital knowledge that could accommodate such a huge training set. As we all know, the internet is a cesspool <laughs> for lots of reasons. So, um, whatever awful stuff is in your training set might end up learned by your network in ways that you don't recognize until much later, if at all. So it's just, it's very important to be conscious um, that the neural network is going to absorb whatever is in your training set. Um, it's also an ethical concern for another reason, and this is one that was surprising to me and I only learned of recently. Um, you would think that a huge neural network uh, that trains on all the images from Google Images or all of the words from Wikipedia or uh, all of the words scraped from, from Reddit, outgoing Reddit links is another way that people do this. You would think that a network that sees all of that quantity of data had sort of seen enough that it wouldn't remember any individual instantiation of data. And that's not always true. <laughs> so. Um, networks are capable of memorizing information from the training set in a really unsettling way. And it is possible um, through sort of sophisticated querying of the trained network to recover that information um, in a way that can raise uh, real privacy concerns. Um, this is a paper that came out last year. Uh, what the authors did is they looked at a trained uh, language model. This is one that had tra been trained to do autocomplete. So the way this model works is you give it a sequence of words and then it predicts the next word. Um, and then you, you sort of accept that word and it predicts the next word and so on and so on. Um, this is a model that trained on data scraped from outgoing Reddit links. So it had a huge variety of uh, data formats of uh, of subject matter. It wasn't like Wikipedia, where it was all sort of encyclopedic articles. It had a lot of different, um, different types of data. Um, the exact architecture of what's going on in this picture is not super important, but what happened is that this network was trained. Um, it was a very successful uh, prediction network. Um, and because it was a research network, the network, the train network itself, as well as all of its training data are public. Um, and so what these researchers did is that they took this trained network and they figured out that certain unique sequences of words that you feed into this network will result in unique output. Um, and that output can include um, unscrubbed personal information that just happened to be present in the training set. So 
uh, they figured out that if you feed in a sequence of words, East Strasbourg, Strasbourg, which sounds meaningless and indeed is pretty meaningless, but it was enough to trigger the network to predict this sequence that had appeared verbatim in the training set, which was someone's full address, name, uh, email address, phone number, and fax number. So that's quite unsettling, right? Um, and this was public data and it was scraped from the public internet. So this is less unsettling than realizing that there are there are companies like Google that have access to a lot of personal information and are very likely using that personal information, including things like Gmail repositories, to train analogous models. Um, so this is just something we have to be aware of. Like, um, There are real privacy concerns in, in how this data operates. And this is not something I personally, I mean, like, I'm not an expert in this particular subject matter, obviously, but I would never have thought like my network is capable of memorizing the contents of someone's particular email that ended up in the training set, for example. Um, this is very difficult because there's not really, if you're interested in, in modeling the way language works, there's not really a way to randomize it in the same way that you might for, for other types of, of private data. So it's just something to keep in mind. <laughs> um, another consideration um, is that neural networks can be difficult to interpret. They're very complicated, can be even difficult to visualize what's going on. Uh, it's hard to establish why they're making the decisions they're making. Um, and this has become its own field of study, actually, in the past five years or so. Um, and there have been some really sophisticated methods that have been developed to establish why neural networks are making the decisions they make. This is a neural network that was trained to identify um, the set, like just to tag pictures with, with what's in them. Um, and by looking at the outputs of layers sort of progressively in this network, you can start to begin to interpret uh, what each layer is doing. Um, so if you look at the type of data that really activates each layer in turn, you'll see that early layers are concerned with sort of general features like detecting edges in the image. Later, feature, or later layers are concerned with um, higher level representations. Like I, I think, I believe this is probably really hard to see, but if you look at the, the part of the image where the dog's face is, you'll see a lot of little squares that look like dog faces. Like clearly this network has learned, ah, this is a combination of visual input that's meaningful to me and I recognize it here in this image. And this is gonna help me identify this part of the image as a Labrador retriever. Um, this, is, this is another really interesting one. This was a separate network. This was trained to match images to their captions. So in its training, it got mixed up the image and the caption data in a really interesting way. Um, and you can start to understand that if you look at uh, certain unexpected outcomes from this network. So. This is, uh, if you feed in a picture of an apple, it correctly identifies this, uh, uh, this image as an apple, a Granny Smith apple. If you slap the label iPod on this apple, suddenly it's very convinced that this image is of an iPod. <laughs> um, and this is fascinating. I mean, this is clear evidence that this network is, is very mixed up in, in what is coming from the text and what is coming from the image. Um, and not to be like a total paranoid person, but um, they, they, they classify this as an adversarial attack on the network, which is, it's quite funny, but it's, I mean, it's true. They were able to confuse it. You can imagine if for some reason you were using an analogous network to interpret road signs, for example, in a self-driving car, if someone were to just slap a different label on a road sign and you could confuse your network in this way, that could be really troubling, right? So like even the, even the kind of funny examples, you have to really think through like, what are the implications of what's going on here? Like people have this perception of neural networks as intelligent in a way that they are, I mean, they're, they're very powerful, but they're not making intelligent judgments in the way that that word is commonly used. So it's just important to keep in mind. Um, they can require a lot of computational power to train. I know I'm, I'm very conscious of time. I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, there's a huge carbon cost to training these things um, that is often not discussed uh, just because it takes a lot of computational power to train a network that has hundreds of millions or billions of parameters. So this is a paper from 2019 Training one of these big language models one time costs roughly 10% of a single person's air travel uh, across continental US. If you do a full neural architecture search, which means you're, um, you're considering lots of different configurations of the network, trying to optimize like, okay, if we put different layers here, different neurons here, like what performs the best? If you do the full search, you end up with a carbon cost. This is the, the 626,000 uh, pounds of carbon dioxide figure. Um, that's roughly 10 cross-continental flights, like the whole plane, <laughs> not like one person. So 
Um, this is not a problem that's unique to neural networks. I mean, if you're if you're doing things like big cosmological simulations, anything that requires a lot of computing power is something to be aware of. And it's not something that's ever uh, discussed really, but it is it is an ethical consideration. So, um, and these things are not training on like huge server farms. They're training on uh, basically like little kind of graphics card uh, GPU unit that you might slide into a desktop computer. Um, just a handful of those for, for several days at a time. So uh, just important to keep in mind. Um, neural networks are also only good at, at uh, reproducing within a training set. This is another reason that they're not really intelligent. They can't extrapolate. They're only just gonna, they're gonna reproduce what they learned from the training set. And so whatever biases are present in the training set, they're gonna pop out in the trained network. Um, and there's a lot of problems <laughs> that become apparent from the sort of the small scale way up to the large scale. This is just an example. I, I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of three or four big scandals just from the last year, sort of locked down Twitter going crazy over one thing or another. Uh, this is an example of what happens when Google Translate tried to translate from Hungarian to English. Hungarian is a language that only has gender neutral pronouns. And you can see that when you translate it to English, uh, the algorithm is deciding on she or he based on gender stereotypes in the profession at the end of the sentence. So this is not optimal, this is not ideal. Um, and I'll skip over the next example just as conscious of time, but there's reasons, right? It's not just in sort of silly examples like that. Uh, neural networks are everywhere. They're already making decisions on behalf of real people um, and they're already encoding biases that are really negatively affecting people's lives. So this is a study that was done in 2019 of an algorithm that an insurance company uses uh, to decide which patients need follow-up health care. Uh, presumably because the algorithm is, algorithm is proprietary, they don't say exactly what it is or even if it's a neural network, but I think it's a safe assumption that it is because it's the kind of thing that neural networks are used for. What this algorithm does is it takes in a patient's health data and it's assigned, it assigns them a risk score. So the higher the risk score, the sicker it considers you to be. And if you're above a threshold score, it's, it's, it, send, it recommends that you be sent for further screening. Um, so that's a, a score of 55 or something. And the authors of this paper looked at the real patients who have been really studied by this algorithm and really assigned a risk score. And they found that the white patients uh, and the black patients who received the same score, the black patients were considerably sicker. So a black patient had to be much sicker before the algorithm would recommend them for further health screening. Um, why is this happening? <laughs> this is happening because the network was not actually assigned um, to predict illness or health outcome. It was assigned to predict cost of treating the patient. Um, and for historical reasons in the US, uh, a lot less money is spent per black patient than per white patient. So a black person has to get a lot sicker before it becomes cost effective to preemptively treat them or screen them than for a white patient. So the network learned this bias, it enacted this bias. This is obviously not acceptable. Uh, and it's a sign that um, transparency in terms of the algorithms is not only about what data exactly the algorithm is using and how it's making its predictions, but it's also who designed this algorithm and for what purpose, right? Like clearly, I mean, it's not actually that surprising that an insurance company would be making its decisions based on health costs. We know that this happens. Um, so it's, it's, it's all a really important um, aspect of interpreting uh, and hopefully regulating these networks. And that's my final point. These networks are not widely understood by the public. They're not well regulated. Um, I just wanted to finish with this example. This is a clip of Tesla's full self-driving mode uh, from March of this year. <laughs> um, and over this 45 second clip, we're gonna see it make several really unacceptable mistakes. Luckily, there's a human driver um, here at the wheel to correct for these mistakes. We've seen it just stop in the middle of a lane here. It's an turn only lane when it shouldn't be. Um, we're about to see it driving on the wrong side of the road, <laughs> uh, trying to turn onto a one way <laughs> street. Um, wrong side of the road. Uh, and it's about to make a really dangerous crossing of an intersection. And of course, this should not be on the road. I think we can all agree. <laughs> this is extremely dangerous. I, I don't doubt that neural networks could eventually perform as well as human drivers. I think that's almost certainly going to happen in the future. It's just not there yet. And yet this car is on the road um, and this should not be allowed. <laughs> like, I think that's a pretty straightforward thing. So um, I just wanna conclude there. Um, I think, again, it's an important part of scientific literacy in the present moment to recognize that these networks are important. They're out there in the world, they're making decisions on behalf of all of us, um, and yet they are not widely understood, they're not well regulated. 
Um, and I think that should change. So <laughs> I just wanted to, to finish there. If you're interested in networks for yourself, here are a handful of Python packages that can use to, to begin to explore. I recommend PyTorch myself, but I hear good things about Keras. I wouldn't recommend Scikit-learn. Uh, and finally, here's just some recommended reading. Um, I'll send these slides out, or I'll send them to David and, and, and make sure you all receive this too if you're interested. So um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I know I've run over time. So um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, let's uh, show your appreciation for Emily for her time. Wow, you covered so much there, Emily. Very impressed with how much you covered. Um, Too much, so we, I think. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> that was wonderful. I learned a lot from that as well. Um, would anyone like to ask Emily any questions?